Yeah. Right. He's definitely terrified. <laughs> right. And he's not happy with what he's seeing. <laughs> yeah, right. Which may have, may have been a reasonable reaction in the in the school like the way I learned how to draw was I went to I used to go to heroes and I would just like go one by one down the aisle it was pretty crazy thinking about it I was like 15 years old and I would be like what do you think of my work what do you think of my work and I did that every year for like 10 years that's pretty (laughs) awesome (laughs) (laughs) you see those kids going around and you kind of like some of them you'll see again and others, you're not sure, like, if they're going to keep going. <laughs> so it's it's cool that it worked and that you kept doing it. And, like, getting those critiques wasn't demoralizing. Because coming from an art school background, critique is just like, okay, here are the facts. And sometimes that's terrible for someone who doesn't do that. Who, like, doesn't, like, isn't from a world where you just straight up tell someone what's wrong with their thing that they love. I feel like that first experience is probably still jarring though. You know, just people straight up looking at what you're doing and telling you straight. Um, I had been doing that for a long time because my dad was a writer. So we just knew lots of artists and he had them talk to me straight. I still remember like very clearly one of them when I was like 12 or whatever telling me that my drawing of Sailor Moon, the lighting was coming from different places and it didn't make any sense. And that's like stayed in my head. And on the one hand, I think about it all the time because it was a good critique on the, but then like also what a crazy thing to tell a kid, <laughs> like a 12 year old, it's just drawing <laughs> Sailor Moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, why don't you just kill all my joy while you're at it? <laughs> I think maybe at that point they probably knew well enough that this is just what I was going to do and I was going to keep doing it. (laughs) But yeah, I just think about that a lot. (laughs) So your dad was a writer and you, you lived in New York. Is that right? New York city. Yeah. Yeah. He moved there from Pennsylvania to be a writer. So like he has lots of stories about being, completely dirt poor having just moved to New York from the sticks and like just eating Vienna sausages every day like he couldn't even look at a can of Vienna sausages because that was just his struggle food for his like however long when he first moved to New York (laughs) because my mom moved to New York in the 70s but like she also had to like run from the communists like she had to escape China by swimming to Hong Kong so if New York was kind of scary, she had probably seen some shit already. Exactly. So. So growing oh. up in New York, though, is fascinating to me because it's, it's so, you know, and I, I spent a year and a half there um, and it really changed my head. Uh, it really made me a better artist and like probably a better writer um, and I hope a better person. But um because before I moved there, I was very impatient. Yeah. And it forces you into a speed that you don't have a lot to say about, you know? Um, yeah, that's true. What's that do to your relationship to art, you know? Because it felt like, to me, like when I was there, a lot of people would either, like, hold stuff in too much esteem and, or the people who were making stuff happen were just kind of like aware of who they wanted to be and I, and I felt like I was lucky that I was already I'd already decided like I'm going to do comic books before I got there because I probably would have lost steam had I not so like I had two people who were doing like work work in artistic fields but definitely I saw the grueling side of it And so it, I think, put art in a different perspective because I knew it was work. 
that it wasn't just this like lofty high ideal. It was something that like people had to really think about and put a lot of thought into. And in some cases, you know, you were just churning it out. Like my mom, she wasn't designing stuff. She was on, she was a pattern maker. So like the designers would give her drawings and then she would figure out like how that physically translates into the different shapes and fabric. Well, being a fine artist is such an outlier thing, you know. I mean, I think you hit it on the head that most artists are pretty blue collar. Um, well, but e even the ones that like a lot of the fine art, like the Renaissance guys, they yeah. were commissions. Yeah, right. I, that's one of the things I have to keep, I, I keep in mind is that like until recently, the fine arts were just guys who were getting paid to draw stuff that rich people asked them to draw. Right. That's why it was like all Bible or all naked ladies. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> it's all subversive Bible. <laughs> yeah. And some of it was naked ladies in Bible. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a, that's another reason why I wanted to make this thing was because I feel like most people, especially in who, I was, I'm still fairly divided about this. Like, I like having the table, so to speak, that divides me from the audience. Um, but I also think the, the audience has been done a disservice, and by virtue of that, we have too, in the sense that everybody thinks art's a magic trick. Right. You know, like everybody thinks that it's just like, you were born good at it. You know, and I wasn't. And that's the difference between why you get to do this and why I don't. And, you know, there's certainly, a, especially in my case, a lot of like luck and privilege that goes into that. But it's also sure. a lot of hard work and putting yourself in a position to be lucky, you know. Um, and I, it's also, too, going back to what we were saying earlier, being the sort of person, even when you're really little, when people say, you got to stop drawing or this is a weird drawing to say, okay, screw you. I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> I'm going to figure out what horses look like. <laughs> My ego was so out of control. I remember I redesigned like the most quintessential Jason Latour story is when I was in like fourth grade. I, re I redesigned Star Wars. What? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because I, I was just like, it's not badass enough. <laughs> I remember I gave like Jabba the Hutt like spider legs and like, you know, <laughs> bigger guns for everybody. <laughs> I should do that adaptation, you know, like that, that Star Wars. So I love um, like Luke still being Luke and uh, like not wanting to join the fight at first, but he's a Liefeld character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, where did he get all those muscles? <laughs> right, like, why Why does he look like this if he's not going to do this? Why does he look like a battle-grizzled 40-year-old man? <laughs> <laughs> Where did those scars come from? <laughs> yeah. Sloppy segue. But I was going to say that um, one of the things I find really interesting about your work is, like, uh, we have some similarity in the sense that the most popular things that we're known for are things that are sort of seen as all ages, maybe. Yours a little more than mine. Um, but uh, but I really appreciate the effort to like uh, not let that be the only thing that defines you. Um, yeah, I just, I like too many different things. Right. And I can't pretend to just like the one thing. Personally, I always felt like, um, I just want to make good things that I'm into. And then hopefully when I move to the next thing, enough people will be like, well, I liked that thing. Mm -hmm. What's the thing it's going to do? Um, it's weird to me when people take it the other way around. I think it's a self-defeating prophecy. You, yeah. know, you kind of age yourself. Um, well, there's you can't be doing your best work if you're trying to figure out what someone else wants from you, as opposed to just making the thing you want to do. <laughs> Like, my, my favorite stuff is, like, 
highbrow artsy or like pure garbage because those are the things where people are going for it <laughs> like they don't give a shit they're just making what they want to make and they do not care what you think and it, the stuff in between where it's like okay i figured out the math there's a three-part structure that's what people like it works it'll be good like it i don't care i've seen it <laughs> i want to see someone just go like balls to the wall insane and that's sort of what those two ends have. I watched RoboCop yesterday again. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course. <laughs> yes, I <as> does. <laughs> this would be a real good, like, if I could leave this in, this would be real good for all the people that say, like, oh, it's the girl that draws Squirrel Girl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, you, you say that, like, I don't have, like, the, the latest several disc Blu-ray of RoboCop right behind me. <laughs> when I was in fourth grade, my dad took me and my brother to see RoboCop, which my brother was in kindergarten. Wow. And, I, and <laughs> did people know from the advertising how violent it was? I don't know. I think he just saw an ad in the newspaper and said, oh, that looks robot man. Gotcha. We're on a real wild game here. But yeah, I find yeah. it really. <laughs> 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 Even RoboCop, like, I think of RoboCop as being fairly, like, of that era being a little progressive, in a sense. Like, it's all commentary about, like, capitalism and basically how the world actually wound up turning out. <laughs> My dad, I remember looking over at him several times early on, even in fourth grade, thinking, like, this is, we're getting away with some shit, right? Someone dropped an F-bomb. And he said, one more of them, we're going home. <laughs> now, granted, in this movie, several people had already been violently murdered. There'd been a full nudity. Yep. <laughs> you know, there'd been, you know, all kinds of implied, like, violence. And uh, on some level, I wonder what, who I would have turned out, how I would have turned out had I not been traumatized by that dude getting shot. <laughs> <laughs> that dude when he, when RoboCop shoots that guy in the in the junk, it fucking wrecked me as a little kid. I was like, that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had that like that version of when little kids learn about mortality, but just uh, in one specific <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I find that really interesting that that's a thing that you uh, work. I guess it's an active decision, right? Like to you know pursue your your fancy, you know, find a way to make it commercial, but um. yeah, I just I just can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. I get bored too easily. Did you feel like there was a risk of alienating maybe younger kids or did you feel like maybe they grow into it? Um, I mean, it, it was possible. I yeah. I guess I was just sort of hoping that like whatever I'm doing, it can get marketed enough that they'll find some sort of audience. Yeah. I also have, like, plenty of adult. adult audience as well, so we'll see. I mean, my next thing is going to be along the YA spectrum again, and then the one after that. Well, right now I'm working on definitely an adult book, and then the next thing will be YA, and then after that is, like, dystopia YA. It's pretty cool to bounce back and forth, though. It's like, you, know, uh, you see actors do it all the time, you know, yeah. where they bounce forth, back and forth between projects, and it doesn't seem to limit their ability to do all kinds of work, even though they're way more recognizable. Their faces are in the things. It somehow permeates what we do, this weird idea that, like, if you do horror comics, you do horror comics. Or if you do superheroes, you do superheroes. Um, and I was reading, again, in the same interview, you were talking about how you grew up in a household with comics and it sort of tore those borders down, maybe? Well, I think, like, also, um, my dad, like, we, he had a lot of books, we watched a lot of movies together, and he never cared about genre. It was always, is this a thing that I like? But it didn't matter 
what kind of thing it was, if it was like, or who it was marketed towards. If it was good, it was good. And so I grew up with that kind of thinking where like, yeah, you can like all sorts of stuff. You can like watch a romance and then watch a horror. There, there are things in both of those that you can find enjoyable as long as whoever put it together cared enough to make it good. Yeah, I, I kind of have a hard time um, being somebody that buys all into any one kind of thing. You know, I enjoy stuff that bleeds together. Yeah. Even superheroes. It's like, that was what introduced me to art. And I like some of these movies and stuff, but that's almost in spite of the fact that they're movies. Because what I like right. about superheroes is kind of the... Uh, the uh, just that when it's on paper, it has no limits. Yeah, I was... Uh, I was teaching comic stuff recently and one of the things that I started thinking about a lot was how you can kind of tell the same stories with like film or audio or just pure prose or comics which has a couple of those elements but film you're constrained the most because it's the most related to what our experience is moment to moment. Like people are moving, they're real people, you, you're hearing them talk. With prose, you can kind of go all the way insane and nothing has to even look like anything that exists. And comics exist in this weird world where there are images, but they're not images of real people, they're drawings of people. And the way that you're experiencing movement of time and dialogue are abstract as well. And so you can abstract ideas and the world because you're already dealing with an abstract way to take in the world. So it's like, it's hard for a movie like Scott Pilgrim to get it right because you're taking elements that don't exist in the real world and adding them to it. Whereas the comic, it's just, that's just how you have to experience it. And so you can make things weirder because it's already weird. 